Hello, my name is Mark Pimentel. I'm a CAM application specialist here at Hawkridge Systems. And in this video, I'll be showing you how to deburr cross holes. Now I'll be using a function called curve projection to deburr these cross holes. So um, cr uh, curve projection is a very useful function, uh, but here I'm just gonna use it for one application, but it can apply to any kind of undercut or any kind of curve following uh, toolpath that you're looking to generate. So let's see how that's done. First, let me just uh, get this to be transparent so we can actually see what we're working on. So I have two simple holes there, represented by the hole features I have on the left side here, and they just cross right in the middle there at 90 degrees. But this functionality we're about to do can be used on any kind of cross hole, any kind of undercut where you're following a specific curve. In our case, I'll be following the interface edges here, here, and here. Uh, so first thing we want to do is let's add some features. So I already have my mill parts set up for the direction I want to come from. This is going to be my tool axis, my tool direction. I'm just going to right click on that and go to multi-surface feature. So I'll be using the multi-axis mill operation. So let me just go to my strategy here and I'll grab my five axis strategy, which is going to generate my multi-axis mill operation. Uh, the surfaces I want to work on are going to be the one for this hole here. If I click on this surface here, you'll see it only really highlights the top. And because of the fact that it's crossing with the other hole, it actually generated two different surfaces. So I'm just going to grab the top and the bottom. And then that way, those are the surfaces I'm going to use for my curve projection. Let me just click the green check mark there. I'm also going to want to add an avoid feature. I'm going to want to tell it to avoid colliding with those other surfaces of the other hole. So I'm just going to right click again, multi surface feature. I'm going to define it as an avoid feature, so it gets rid of that operation strategy selection. And I'm just going to grab those two side surfaces as well, for the same reason. That hole has been uh, cut by the fact that it's crossing the other hole, so it's two different surfaces I have to select. Uh, now I'll just go to right-click, generate operation plan. And now I have my operation plan generated here. Uh, so in this case, it defaulted to that half inch ball. I could use that if I was doing any kind of external deburring or maybe even this undercut for whatever reason, maybe the ball would work, but I'm actually looking to use a lollipop. So I'm gonna jump to the tool section, tool crib, and I'm just gonna go down to my half inch lollipop there. I'll click select. Anytime you change the tool, it's gonna ask me if I would like to change the corresponding holder. I'll just say yes. Um, now, depending on the kind of work you're doing, you might want to make sure that you have enough reach so you can see the representation of the tool. You might, you might want to make sure that the holder can reach. In that case, if it doesn't, you can always go and change your protrusion inside of the holder definition. I'm going to jump ahead to the pattern section. And in the pattern section, the method we're using is milling in this multi-axis toolpath. And the pattern itself is going to be the, that curve projection. So the way curve projection works, as you can see on this right graphic here, you choose some sort of a curve, which could be a sketch, which could be the edges of a surface or a solid, and you're projecting it onto that multi-surface feature that we defined. So in my case, it's gonna be those edges I wanna project onto that surface. So I'm gonna go to curve, and I'm really just gonna go over there and just hover over there until I get a highlight, knowing I'm grabbing that curve. And you can see that white dot right there, that represents the start point of that, that loop, basically, that curve that I just selected. So I'm gonna grab these next ones here. Let me just get rid of that face. It's always a good idea to make sure that you hover over first to get that highlight to know for sure that you're grabbing what you want. Just like there, I wasn't paying attention and I clicked on the surface by mistake. So let's grab these two here. And again, the white dots on that side, I'm looking to minimize the travel of the tool while it's inside the hole. So rather than starting at that point, I'm just gonna go down here, I'm gonna change it's the same point as the other loop. So now that should be the common start point for both loops. I'll click the green check mark. And we're talking about a curve projection, so we need to actually project that curve onto that surface. Now as the edge surf the edge of that surface, it's really just projecting onto itself. But we have to understand what we're doing here with this projection direction and this max projection distance. The projection direction, there's only really the two options, the z-axis and normal to surface. Now this is all you'll really ever need because what you're looking to do is just project that curve onto that surface. If you're doing it like the original graphic, you probably would just have something that's planar that you're projecting onto some sort of complex surface. In our case, we're actually looking to just project onto a cylindrical surface. Normal to surface gives us that radial direction, so normal to surface is perfect here. Uh, the projection distance is how far away the curve is from that actual surface. 
Um, normally, this would just be this distance right here, how far away your planar uh, sketches or edges are from the surface you're looking to project to. But in our case, we're doing inside of a hole. I probably don't want to project to a max distance of one inch because the diameter of the hole is one inch. So essentially, this edge here is projecting to all those surfaces because they're within one inch of the, uh, the final surface there. So I'm going to just shrink this down so that it literally just projects back onto itself within that distance of 10 thou. Really, the number just needs to be smaller than the distances from everybody else. So this is just kind of me just making sure I don't project all over the place. Since we're going down this hole, my entry slash retract, well, I'm going to want to make sure that I uh, start from a plane above the part. In this case, I'll just shrink this down to a quarter of an inch. I don't really need to start that far up and wrap it down. Um, if I wrap it from that point, down into the hole and then feed into the edges, that's great, but that's a little sketchy. I don't really want to be wrapping into a hole, so I'm just going to increase this feed length so that I actually start feeding from outside the hole and then engage the material. To engage the material, I'll need to add a lead-in lead-out. So for my lead-in move, I'll say use lead-in. My lead-out move, I'll say use lead-out. And this pull-down menu just calls out the lead-in lead-out but I actually define it in this bottom right section here. So here I'm just going to say, let's use a orthogonal line. Orthogonal, just another way of saying normal. So we're going to come in from a radial direction. And I'm just going to put in a length that would be appropriate for the size of my tool. In this case, it's a half inch ball. I'm just going to put in the radius of the tool. And the same for the lead out. I'll say, let's use a orthogonal line. And we could put in let's say minimum the radius of the tool, I'm just going to be a little safer. Let's say we go to half inch. I'm going to go to the center of that hole. Okay, under links, I'm inside the hole. I don't actually want to move around uh, as much as possible. So rather than doing any kind of linking moves, I'm just going to say, let's go direct in the case of small uh, gaps. And in the case of uh, any kind of large gaps, go direct as well. But to get from any of those directions, I don't want to use any lead and lead out. I don't want any extra movement. I just want to go direct. So let's just set all these to direct and get rid of any kind of use of lead in and lead out. Under gouge checking, I'm going to check all the options here because we are doing an undercut. So I want to make sure that all the diameters are being represented here. I'm going to extend everything to infinity. So that way, if the ball is down here, it still understands not to gouge with any of those surfaces. And any of those link motions, I want to get gouge check as well. Even though I'm going direct, even though I told it not to use any lead and lead out, there might be something there that I'm not aware of. So I'm just going to make sure that this checks everything for me. The real purpose of the gouge check section is to get the software to look for that stuff for you. So I told it what tool I want to use. I told it what surfaces I'm looking to avoid. I'll let it figure out the rest for me. And that's kind of what this lower section is for. I'm going to say apply the gouge checking to pretty much everything because I am doing an undercut. I don't have a holder defined, but if I did or if later I need to add one in here to just double, double check any collisions, I have this checked. On this side here, I'm checking against my feature surfaces. So those are the ones I chose as my features, the multi-surface features. That is the top and the bottom surface. And then for my other surfaces, I'll just click on this guy here and then just grab my predefined surfaces, which are the ones on the sides. If I didn't already predefine it, I can always come down here to create features and then just define it on the fly. So now, now I'm checking against the left and the right. Now, what happens if there is a gouge? What do I want it to do? Well, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that we have those nice cylindrical surfaces, and I'm going to say we're going to move the tool away from those surfaces along that surface normal. So we're just getting it to pull away from the surfaces along the surface normal in that radial direction. That way, I can still deburr my edges without having to gouge anything just because of the shape of my tool or the movement of my tool. Uh, so we're inside of a multi-axis mill operation, but we don't necessarily need to use all those axes. I'm just coming down in Z, looping around, and I want to exit. So to get rid of all this information here, I can just say, let's just limit this to a three-axis movement. And that's pretty much, pretty much it. I don't need to do anything else here. Uh, the only other thing maybe you want to do is just turn off maybe adaptive cuts. We're not really looking to do any kind of adaptive cuts here, so I'm just going to turn it off just to make sure it doesn't add any additional passes that I'm not looking to uh, to achieve here. Uh, as always in CamWorks, before I leave this screen, I might want to just do a quick preview in case I want to make any changes. So I'm just going to click Preview, and we'll take a look at the wireframe of our toolpath. Okay, so we can already see some movement here. From that red plane, you can see it wrapids down to that first feed direction, and it just feeds all the way down. In my case, that lead-in actually was a little larger. 
Now, the gouge check took care of it for me. It actually stopped short of gouging with those walls, but I kind of wanted to just start down the middle of that hole. So I'm just going to go back in here, go into my entry slash retract, and I'm going to put that back to that 250. So even though I put a number that's probably too large for there, it did pull it back, it did check it for me, but I know I want to go a little bit more down the middle of the hole there, so I'm just going to put it back to 250. And you can see from the color coding of our wireframe, the red is the rapid, the blue is the actual movement of the tool, so I, I feed down, I feed in, and I'm just going to do my loops. And I could do that while still in preview by going back up to this little header over here. And you can see there's the step through icon. With our step through here, I'm just going to play it through slow. Okay, so it does the one loop. And then at that common start point, it does the next loop. So it's one fluid motion. And that's what I'm looking for when I'm inside of a hole. I don't want any extra movements. I want everything to just go exactly where I want it to go. And then it feeds out. Uh, and what you'll notice is that it is actually offset from the edges there. If we kind of move this guy around, you can see that it's a little offset. Because of the shape of the lollipop, it actually is uh, pulling away from those walls, but still maintaining that edge there. Um, so if I just click the green check mark on this one, we can do or check on this. And what we can do is we can just make this guy transparent. So if I go over here to the stock, we'll just make this a translucent display. I can bring up a shaded display of our final part. Maybe even make that one translucent as well so we can kind of see on the insides there. And if I play through this, we can see that I got my gouge. Okay, so. And that is because I didn't represent the, um, the drilled holes. So let me click OK on that. Just regenerate this. And if we play this all the way through from the beginning, that drills our holes and then it gets rid of the gouge. So that's one thing you want to keep in, in mind when you do this sort of um, simulation, uh, that depending on how you define this or how you're selecting your simulation, you might actually want it to, to incorporate the previous ones. So that way you're not gouging into material that you already have removed. Now there's a way around that. If I'm looking to just represent just that one tool, I can hold the shift key right click and then go to simulate because then it's going to ask me do I want to incorporate these tool paths in that representation uh, and the answer is yes I wanted to know if I'm gouge checking against the material that is not there and I had already removed that material so I'm just going to go in here I'll say give me a fine quality give me that fine resolution and now it starts off with those holes already removed so especially with this sort of operation um, there might be some pocketing there might be some other operations that I don't want to sit through just to get to the deburring so that's another way to get to this quickly uh, so let's just run through this and of course, if there were any gouges, it would stop for me. But if we take a look at that, you can see that it just kind of kissed the edge there. In the simulation, it doesn't really know if there's burrs there or not, but you can see a little bit of kissing there. And if we do our representation here, the edges are clean. So I have deburred the inside of this cross uh, uh, the cross holes using curve projection, but uh, it doesn't have to be just for deburring. This can be for any movement where you want to control the exact movements of the tool using some sort of curve. And an easy way to do that is get a surface that you want to project to first, and then just sketch your trajectory. If you have any questions on this or anything else, you can always give us a call at the main tech line uh, at, on the using the uh, phone numbers on our website. Um, if you like any other videos, stay tuned to this channel, like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.